if you had a house guest who just hit you all the time with things that were irrelevant to you but alarming and disturbing, that's a house guest you would throw out. Danny, have you decided what you want for your birthday? This just in, a Chicago man whom neighbors described as a loving father shot and killed his three children before turning the gun on himself. The shooting occurred Friday night, though the bodies weren't discovered until Monday morning in what police described was a gruesome crime scene. This just in, researchers at the Stockholm School for Slumber Studies report an increase in the number of sleep-related deaths, including accidental suffocation, choking, heart failure, and other nighttime killers. Next up, the dangers of shaving lotion. New study warns of hair loss, skin cancer, fast-spreading lesions. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good source of information. It's a very good source of anxiety and stress, and it's one of the main reasons that people have ongoing anxiety, and, and so many people are living in a state of fear when they don't have a good cause for it. How could fear be a gift? Well, it is. These feelings are gifts. They're not things we should ignore. The gift of fear is a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD all rolled into one. The vast majority of people we encounter day in and day out are uh, friendly, have no sinister intent for anybody, and the vast majority of our encounters are perfectly safe. If we could know that we wouldn't be afraid of somebody, we could have much greater encounters with strangers, much more frequent cooperation, and it would be a much different world for all of us. And one of the benefits of talking about fear is that to look directly at the truth of something is to be able to recognize it and stop seeing it in everything else. When you know, for example, that somebody's race will not be the reason that they are a criminal, then you can stop being concerned just about African Americans or just about Hispanics or just about big men or just about young men and be concerned only about those situations where behavior or the situation give you a reason for concern. And that makes it possible, surprisingly, to live with far less fear. Remember, true fear is a signal that is meant to be brief in the presence of danger. And so it's in response to something that you sense, you perceive it in your environment. You see it, you hear it, you smell it, you feel it. Then there's unwarranted fear, worry, anxiety, dread, all of those, which is always something in your imagination or your memory. When you fear something, that actually means it is not happening because we never fear what is happening. We always fear what might happen, what might happen next. So a good example would be uh, standing uh, too close to uh, a cliff. So if you're, if you're 10 feet away from it, you're afraid of getting any closer. If you're now five feet from the edge, you're afraid of getting any closer. If you're one foot from the edge, you're afraid of falling. If you're falling, you're afraid of landing. The point is you're always thinking about the next thing. It's always something in the future. And so the very fact that you feel fear means the thing is not happening. And I want to talk for a moment about worry. There used to be an expression, uh, worrying a shoe. A dog worrying a shoe meant chewing on it. That's what the word means, the root, it means to chew on. And that's exactly what we do. We chew on these ideas. In effect, we chew on ourselves and we occupy a lot of our mental real estate with things that are not actually productive, that aren't going to go anywhere. Why do people worry? Well, it serves them in some way. For one thing, they feel connected to other people through doing it. Worry has become, for a lot of parents who are working, it's like a way of loving from the office. They feel connected to their kids whom they can't be with. And for some people, worry is a way to focus on something that is actually less likely. The things we worry about are far less likely than the things we don't worry about. And often it's a more comfortable place to be than actually looking at things when they are 
serious problems. So for some people, it's easier to worry about the maybe child molester in the neighborhood than it is to actually focus on the fellow who's running the recreation center that your kids are visiting, or the relative who's staying with you for the weekend, or somebody actually in your life. And so it's an irony that worry actually enhances risk. And the reason it enhances risk is that it takes you out of the present moment. The very nature of worry is that I'm thinking about something that might happen at some other time, in some other place, and sometimes to some other person. If I'm getting a true intuitive signal about something that I ought to follow up on, worry actually stands in the way. Because worrying actually prevents action. It stalls action because it feels like I'm doing something. The reality is most of the time worry is a waste of time. There is an antidote to worry. The antidote to worry is action. Meaning if you're worried about something and there's something you can do about it, then you take the action. If there isn't something you can do about it, you've just identified it as worry. The highest ground you can get to is reality. That's the only place from where you can see something coming. We live in such a world now where we are barraged with news, and information and things that we are supposed to be afraid of. How do we turn down the noise of that so we actually can see real fear when it's in front of us and feel it? So the first one is the one people seem to have a hard time doing and that's just turn it off. The way most Americans live their lives, the way most Americans go to sleep at night is after seeing, after seeing this. Kidnapper, rapist, prowler, peeping Tom. Robbers, shot to death, shot and killed. Gun down. Sexual misconduct. Police shooting, brazen attack. Permanent brain damage. Died instantly. Epidemic. Satanic cult. Shot and killed. Bank robber. Attacked. Deadly crash. And they opened fire. A massive crime scene. Arrested. A statewide amber alert. Keep doors and windows locked. Vampires. And it could be just as bad tomorrow. It really amounts to a form of electronic terrorism. Right? We are the ones who are terrorized, and not by Al-Qaeda in that circumstance, but by our own news organizations. So turn off the local television news. Turn off the sensational, uninspirational, uneducational, privacy meddling, death peddling, celebrity snooping, helicopter swooping, flesh eating, rumor repeating, mini cam toting, fear promoting TV news. Turn it off and leave it off. And that all by itself opens us up to a whole lot of valid and accurate information that we can find from people who are actually in our lives or that we can find when we choose to go and get the information as opposed to experiencing it this way. When we talk about this intuition, uh, the news is constantly deluging you with the murder, the latest horrible crime, the latest horrible incident, the latest serial killer, serial rapist. And it creates a, uh, an irrational fear a disproportionate, irrational fear that can stop you from listening to that little voice inside. I don't like to go in huge crowds because of all the stuff that's been happening, the shooting in the Batman movie theater and the bombing in Boston. And I, I think, oh, there's a huge crowd. I just, I don't even want to go near it. Because what if someone said that? You're way more likely to get day. killed in a car wreck. I know. Though, but I mean, is that also a rational fear sure. too? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Because um, uh, uh, there, right. you, what you're, what you're okay. leaving out is that there are hundreds of thousands of crowds every day gathered. We're not seeing them on the news because mm. nothing noteworthy happened. And so is a crowd inherently dangerous because there was once a shooting in a movie theater in Colorado or because there was once, once a bomb that went off at a, uh, at a foot race? No, absolutely not, just not at all. And that is allowing the local news and the national news to, and events that are thousands of miles away from you to program your day and your reality. And these are not things that are happening throughout human history. Things have happened in crowds and things have happened at home and things have happened on roads and on mountaintops and all variety of areas that you wouldn't, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to avoid. We don't really get news on television. We get disaster reports. And, and if you pay attention to that, you come away thinking that the world is, is a tightrope in which you take one step to the left and you're doomed, and one step to the right and you're doomed, and there are sharks on both sides, and the, and the, the world is this incredibly frightening, dark, scary, gloomy place. Look, there are darker aspects to the world, of course, and there have always been and there will always be, but 
that does not mean that that is the news. Good things are happening 10 to 1 <laughs> with every disaster report that you get on the 5, 6, whatever o'clock news. Think about this with television. When I was growing up, the, uh, the average American teenager when I was growing up had already watched two years of television. That's two years, 24 hours a day of wow. television. Kids watch television more than they do any other single thing in this life except sleep. Whoa. And so, and what are they seeing? They're seeing a tremendous amount of violence, now police yeah. procedural shows and constant autopsies and constant, I found a fiber, I found a finger, I found a kidney, I found some tissue from the back of the neck. All this kind of stuff is the sort of regular television material right now. And then there's the local news, which is specifically programmed that way. There is 40 hours every day of original programming on the local news that's designed to scare us. 40 hours a day in every major city. And so that's 40 original hours in Chicago and 40 original hours in San Francisco and New York and Los Angeles and San Diego. And it all is the same general format program to get our attention with fear. Why? Because it's a business and it's a very good way to get our attention. Right? If I had true fear right now, you know, there's no way that I won't give it my attention. There's no way to ignore that. And so they are saying constantly, uh, did you hear what happened? It's like somebody running in here into the room and, and saying, uh, you know, that thing's gonna fall on you all the time. It's relentless, it never stops. Yeah. It starts in the morning, before people go to work, and then of course it's going on uh, through dinner, literally through dinner for many families, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the 11 o'clock news, and then the 24-hour news channels, and, uh, and the internet, and so much of it is designed to get our attention with fear. Very little of it is designed to get our attention with good news. And one of the things it communicates is that women cannot protect themselves. Stories invariably speak about a woman being victimized and often there'll be a police officer afterwards telling you what she did wrong. Women shouldn't have been in that park, they shouldn't do this. And always angled toward fear. Uh, I remember a story about an arrest that was made of a man who had committed several rapes in a downtown park. And then they interviewed people on the street and, and they said, uh, but people in the community are still afraid here. And I thought, really? This is good news. The man was arrested. The news story could be, hey, one less rapist in Candlestick Park. But that's not the way they tell it. It's always to use every story in order to cause as much fear as possible. And so the result of this is that millions of people are living in fear when there's no reason to, because nothing's happening in their environment. We are biologically primed to seek survival data. Now, we were not born with flaws. We are not born with fangs. Our great achievement, the greatest survival tool on the planet, is that we can learn from other people's experience. What's the one thing on a highway, other than a cop, guaranteed to slow everybody down in an accident? They, they got the look. What's the one thing on a playground, guaranteed to draw every kid like a magnet in a fight? They'll fight to see a fight. Why? Because if there's violence in our environment, and we're not immediately personally threatened, our survival demands that we watch and learn from it. So what's happening with the news is they're tapping into a fundamental human need to be aware of violence in your environment. They make lots of money giving us what we're biologically designed to seek. And then it short circuits our intuition, our survival instinct. We think we're getting important information. Well, I'll watch the news. I'm a good citizen, I'll watch the news and thus I'll learn about these things. And in fact, it's not teaching about reality, it's teaching about the exceptional, the extraordinary event, which is why it's called news, or what I call it, N-E-W-S, nothing ever worth seeing. Go ahead. What's the point and reason why they want to keep us at such a heightened state of fear? It keeps you watching the show. That's it? It's, it's, Not it's business. <laughs> it's business. Well, it's a lot of businesses. I mean, uh, every government in world history has used fear to control its population. Usually it's fear of a particular enemy, right? Every culture in world history has had some kind of enemy. And uh, we're not much different. But this thing is commercial, meaning the television news is a, is a formula that works. And people sometimes say to me when I'm critical of TV news, they say, well, those things are happening, aren't they? Yes, those things are happening, but you're choosing, you're cherry picking those things that are driven by one primary choice mechanism. And that is, is there video? Is there alarming video? That's the thing. You've heard the expression, if it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. 
I think one of the greatest things to understand about how the media is communicating information is the difference between the written word, the spoken word, and visual imagery. It's one thing to, to tell a, a fairy tale, a scary story. It's another thing to watch Grandma be eaten by the big bad wolf in vivid, gory detail. Imagine you've got a five-year-old child and uh, the puppy is killed, run over by a car. Do you want to tell your child that the puppy was run over by a car and deal with her reactions and soothe her in whatever way you can, or do you want her to see the puppy crushed under the wheel of the car? Oh. <laughs> Violent visual imagery. The visual dynamic of the buildings coming down or the man looking at you with fear, or you know, the, 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 the alarm on the face of the individual, the, the voice that they communicate it with, that, that visual dynamic is processed completely differently. If you want information, my suggestion is go and get the information. Every kind of thing is available. And also my suggestion is read. Read information rather than take it in through video. Because the images that are put forth in the local news are designed to cause fear, designed to elevate your heart rate, designed to get and hold your attention. But if you get information by reading, you decide where it goes in and how it goes in. You decide how it affects your physiology. You decide what to imagine. And if you get information by seeing it, it's a much more alarming and much more disturbing thing. If you think back on all the local news that we've all watched, how many times watching the local news did you say, quick, get a pen, I've got to take some immediate action because that story is re relevant to me. It's very, very rare that the story is about the school your kids are in or about the hospital that a family member is in or about the car you're driving. It's very, very rare that it has any relevance to us specifically. You know, we weren't built to know about information 3,000 miles away. It makes no difference that there's a police chase and a shooting in Miami today. We're in Los Angeles. It's not gonna have any impact on us. I remember getting ready for a, uh, a meeting and I was in a hotel room and on the television set was a downtown high-rise fire. And I thought, oh, you know, I, get the, I, I keep the news muted and I got the thing and I uh, unmuted it and it turned out that the fire was in Caracas, Venezuela. It's not gonna burn me. It has nothing to do with my afternoon. It's not going to have an impact. Yes, Bob? When we talk about here and now, the day after 9-11, I went out for a run, and as I was running, I realized that had I not watched television, my life would not have changed at all. Mm. It was just that awareness. The people were still dropping their kids off at school. I was 3,000 miles away from the event, and it just literally nothing had changed. Obviously, it did change the society, changed as a result, but it didn't change my life at that moment. It's a very good point. After 9-11, ABC and NBC and CNN and Fox mm -hmm. did not want it to calm down, and so they really got into high gear about anthrax. In just a week's time, we have had four confirmed cases of anthrax, all with media connections. The U.S. House of Representatives is closing offices today until Tuesday to allow a complete sweep for traces of anthrax. Another day of germ warfare and still no sign. The worst case of bioterrorism in this country is close to being solved. And a story that I want to tell you involved Tom Brokaw. Tonight we find ourselves in the unusual and unhappy position of reporting on one of our beloved colleagues, a member of my personal staff who has contracted a cutaneous anthrax infection. His assistant uh, received anthrax in, a, in an envelope, as a few news organizations did. So Bro Brokaw went on the air and he described his experience as uh, the ultimate nightmare which doesn't leave much exaggeration left for all the things that happened to us. Like, if that's the ultimate nightmare. I want to tell you what happened with his experience. His uh, assistant had to take Cipro, uh, an antibiotic, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Period. Oh. <laughs> that's the whole story. So I remember they, they, they ran out of Cipro at that time. People yes. were buying it, and they were going crazy. My but they, mom said but they didn't scared. run out, and that's oh. also an NBC story that said shortage of Cipro. Uh, <laughs> true, shortage of Cipro, because you're telling everybody they got to get Cipro for anthrax that isn't coming. Mm -hmm. And by the way, here we are all these years later, and naturally we can see it hasn't come. And uh, Cipro was, wasn't the only antibiotic that worked. Mm. It just happened to be the most popular one. There were many, many other brands of antibiotics that worked equally well that were available. It seems like people are willing to question advertising. 
you know, but we want to be able to trust the news. It is also a form of advertising, the news. I call it ad feartizing. Yeah. And it is part of an entire economy that uh, relies upon fear. One of the things that would be a great accomplishment, in my view, is if people were educated about how to watch the news and interpret the stories that are put on and understand that it's a business and they're in the business of getting your attention and they're in the business of competing with their competitors. And the rush to get it first has way eclipsed the rush to get it right. And they can basically speculate right now and fix it later. Nobody remembers what was said two hours ago and a, a tremendous amount of it is speculation, but it is rarely speculation that's favorable. And the theories become fact. You know, they, they say, well, this is our theory. And the other phrase that you see a lot that you didn't see 50 years ago in particularly the print media um, was sources say, you know, or as reported by the Associated Press. Well, you read that article and they don't have any facts either, but one person reports it and so they can intellectually stay relatively honest by saying that was our source. That's what they said. So it wasn't us years ago that fact checking never would have survived and, and you couldn't run a story unless you had three independent sources of information. And now there's no sources of information. It's just picking up Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds and reporting them as fact. And anytime you're seeing a developing story, meaning you're seeing it on the television news while it's happening, you're getting 90% speculation yeah. about what it might be. Yeah. And uh, you know, by the time information has actually been learned, that's really the time to get it. You know, I think the biggest misconception about television news is that there's a value in learning something early. The reality is it's far better to learn it late when all the information is accurate, when there's a lesson to take from it, when there's some ability to assimilate it. But to learn something while it's happening, the urgency button is the button they're pushing. But here we are in this room, there is nothing going on on the local news, which starts in a few minutes, there is nothing going on that's urgent for us, right? And that is really the, the key to their product, is the idea that you need to learn it soon. For, uh, you know, a, a, a car chase on the freeway, the cops are chasing a car, and the car's not pulling over. Uh, well, that may turn out to be an elderly woman who didn't look up in the rearview mirror, or it may turn out to be Osama bin Laden. We have no idea what it's going to be. But they're tracking it as if you need to know it right now, and they're interrupting the television programming to say, well, I'm here on the San Diego freeway where just moments ago, and they interview the highway patrolman, and they, they say, uh, uh, do you think that he could be armed? And the highway patrolman says, well, he could be armed, anybody could. Oh, so you've heard it now, and uh, two drivers and uh, the car that could be armed, there may be guns, please suspect there are guns in the car, they're gonna approach the car as if there are guns, and now here it goes, and now it's a big drama. And we're watching it for, and they're following it for one reason only and that is to see if there's a shooting at the end of it, mm -hmm. right? To see if this ends in a police shooting. There's no other component to it because we know how it's going to end. It's either going to be that you go long enough, you'll run out of gas, end of news story. The person will decide to pull over, end of news story. The person will drive erratically and crash things. Whatever happens, we can see it in video. There's no purpose to seeing it live with the three helicopters following a car down the 405 for some reason. It's a waste of our time and it gets our attention only by implying there's some urgency. And unless I'm on the 405 freeway right now, it really makes no difference to my life what's going on with a car that isn't pulling over. I like one of the phrases I hear a lot. Um, this is an interview you'll only hear on Channel 2. Well, a lot of other stations covered it, but this particular interview from their reporter, you're only gonna hear on their channel. Every other station is carrying the same story with an interview, but you won't see this one. You say, oh, well, I gotta tune in to them because they got all the cool stuff and the race to get who's first. You know, we were there first. So what? What that means is watch us and you'll get it bad news faster. You know, we, we can deliver this bad news much quicker than anybody else can. I promise you that when you get to understand the news media and how they work this stuff out, how they put it together, it becomes funny, even some of the most disturbing stories. If there's no video of something that isn't happening that they want to scare you about, then they trot out the footage from an incident five years ago. And if there were no survivors in a tragedy, 
they'll literally have a psychologist interviewed who speculates about their final moments. Uh, and if nothing like it has ever happened in the history of the planet, then they have an animated version for you. I want to show you a fast video that's a good example of this, talking about a recent earthquake we had in Los Angeles, which was super minor. If you can go ahead. We did get lucky this time, but the magnitude 4.4 earthquake is a jolting reminder of the need for a quake warning system in the Southland. This quake comes less than two weeks after news anchors ducked for cover during the so-called St. Patrick's Day shake. The guy <laughs> ducked. <laughs> Yep. We're having an earthquake. So no wonder Southern Californians are on edge. What if the epicenter wasn't beneath this bedroom community of modest homes and apartments, but beneath the skyline of downtown LA? And what if it wasn't a quiet Northridge dawn, but a red flag day citywide like these have been with gusting Santa Ana winds? Can you imagine America without LA? We estimate 1,600 fires will be started. If we then have a Santa Ana wind condition, we will not be able to keep those fires in control. Internet and cell service could be lost for days or longer. The death toll in the thousands. It's just a matter of time. Suddenly the question they're posing is, uh, what kind of America would it be without Los Angeles? As if it <laughs> blew off <laughs> into space. And so speculation, supposition, rumor, gossip, projection, and conjecture. That's what it is all the time. One that I heard that, um, I just, just have to love. And the voiceover came on at four o'clock and it said, something you have for dinner tonight might be the last thing you ever eat. News at 11. I mean, do you have dinner? I, I, I don't know. You remember the flesh eating disease? Flesh eating disease was great. It was one of these, uh, honey, get in here quick, you gotta see this news story. It's just fantastic, they loved it. So uh, flesh eating disease came and went, obviously none of us got it. And then uh, a year later, some news organizations said, you know, just a year ago today, the flesh-eating disease made its way across the ocean from London and here, blah, blah, blah. and it said, we have here today a woman uh, who will speak about this, and I had just met her in the hallway. I was there to do a book interview, and I'd met her and shaken hands, and I thought, I wish they'd told me this, about this before I shook hands with her. But the reality is I didn't get it, she didn't have it. What she had was a fear of getting it. So they were interviewing a woman who was afraid of getting the flesh-eating disease. And uh, afterwards, what I really remember about that day is that I talked to a news producer and I said, really, uh, you know, what, what's that segment about? What, what did anybody get out of that segment? And he said to me, a little worry never hurt anybody. And I thought, except for the fact that anxiety kills more Americans every year than all the foreign viruses and all the electromagnetic fields and all the blown up buildings put together through high blood pressure and addiction and heart disease and hypertension and depression and suicide and all the other stress-related ailments. And every night there's a new study, but we never see the study I'd like to see, the one that says watching the local news is profoundly bad for your health. That's not a study they give us. So one of the ways that I think we can all get better at, uh, at being news consumers and media consumers is understanding a bit of their language and how it works. And so I wanna talk about a few examples of it and uh, my hope is that we can look at this differently in the rare times that we have to see it. One is the word possible. Possible doesn't really have the specificity that one hopes for in, uh, in getting information, given that it's completely accurate when applied to anything and anyone on Earth. It's all possible. Uh, a possible connection between memory loss and the air you breathe means there's no connection. Uh, officials are worried about possible attacks against means no attacks. The next one is linked. If you broaden your criteria enough, anything is linked. Uh, but they're not instructively linked. They're not linked together in a way that's valuable for us to know. But they're a great news trick because what you can do is take a small, unconfirmed, or even unimportant news event and link it to something big and important. So next up, possible links to terrorism. That's all you have to do today to get a lot of attention in a story. Another one is the phrase, our nations. Apostrophe S, like our nation's water supply, our nation's roadways, our nation's shipping ports. They use this trick to imply that there's some large scale threat when really it's a small scale threat. For example, uh, a real story of a truck that somebody drove accidentally into a water reservoir in Wisconsin and the news story said a new threat to our nation's water supplies. So they usually try and give significance to something that doesn't have a lot of significance. So if it, if it said, uh, a new threat to Klopp County's water supply, we wouldn't listen. But a new threat to our nation's water supply becomes a big deal. 
There's nothing on earth that can threaten our entire nation's anything. It's a big country. Not even nuclear bombs can destroy the nation or threaten our nation's anything. Another one, uh, shocking new details. Well, shocking new details, uh, first of all, they won't be new. We'll have heard them four <laughs> times already today. And if they were so critical, why are they waiting until after the commercial, right? If I need to know it right this second. Another one, officials are closely monitoring. And then whatever the story is, officials are on the lookout for. And the implication is that something's about to happen and that it's important and that it's big. And basically, these things become news stories often because a news reporter asks an official, um, you know, do you have enough supplies for uh, a, an emergency that would involve blah, blah, blah. And if an official says yes, all you have to do is up the numbers. Well, what if 10,000 people came into the hospital at the same time? And then the story they use is, officials admit that hospitals are ill-prepared. This is a kind of story they do where they can take almost any kind of event and say hospitals would not be prepared if, well, absolutely, if there were 7,000 people coming in in the same hour, they wouldn't be prepared. <laughs> if all the water ran out, we wouldn't have enough water. And you can make one of these unprepared stories about absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. But these are big ifs. These things aren't happening. Another one, an alarming percentage. The words an alarming percentage can be applied to any percentage you want to apply it to. So what I always do when I hear an alarming percentage is I reverse the percentage and see how does it look on the favorable side. They're giving us the unfavorable side. 15% of Americans are at risk of being seriously injured in car accidents, right? But it also means 85% aren't. As many as, when they use those words, as many as 5,000 people could be killed. Well, as many as means anywhere from zero to whatever number I want to choose. All of these are about not being specific so that our imagination, it sounds like it's bad. Uh, in a developing story, this is uh, what they use when they don't have the story yet. They call it a developing story. Another one is experts. You know, there's always an expert on this or an expert on that. They ask experts the same question over and over again to get the kind of response they want. So for example, if a newscaster is asking questions and not liking the answers they're getting, they say in edited material, meaning it's not what the audience is gonna see, yes, yes, Dr. Stevens, but if it did happen, it would be terrible, wouldn't it? And they said, well, it would be a terrible thing if, and now you have the leading expert talking about the terrible thing that he's been telling the newscaster for 20 minutes isn't going to happen. And then finally, the wrap-up. The wrap-up on all these news stories is always something to give it extended fear quotient. They'll say, uh, many here are left wondering if it will ever be safe, or fear continues its tight grip on this tiny community. I'll give you a good example. Years ago, there was a kidnapping of a whole busload of children in Chowchilla, California, where uh, a group of people conspired to take the whole busload of children and, and the plan was to ask the community for ransom. And they drove the bus way out of town. They found an abandoned quarry and they drove it down into a pit and they put rocks on top of it so it couldn't be found. And they eventually got caught and all the kids were fine. So story ends and then a year later, you'll invariably see the newscaster walking down, slowly down the street in Chowchilla. I'm standing here where just last year, same story, same footage, same thing. But he ends the story, as they always do, with uh, something scary. He says, but the people of this small town still go to sleep at night, wondering if it could all happen again. <laughs> no, it cannot all happen again. Nobody else is gonna kidnap a whole busload of children and put them in a quarry. <laughs> This is a good time to be laughing because my best wish would be that we could help people to see the real humor in the nature of the presentation. Stories are not funny, but it's funny. One of the destructive elements of a whole society living in fear without reason uh, is that we're then giving those fears to our children and we're asking them to live lives that are uh, you know, free of every conceivable kind of risk. I saw that on the news, and so now we don't use that product, or now we don't go to that place, or now we don't let the kids do that particular activity. It's interesting that for almost all of human history, parents taught their children about the hazards of their environment. If you lived in the woods, you learned about the bears and the snakes, and you were taught don't play with them. Um, and we've lost that. That if, if you lived in Arkansas, you didn't talk much about shark attacks. You talked about what was going on in your environment. I wish for children as extended a period of fearlessness as they can have, and then 
an education about fear that makes them feel like they're not just victims, but that they actually have the power mm. to protect themselves and the people around them using not you know, a library of guns, but their own intelligence. A good way to extend uh, what you call a life before fear for particularly little kids is, uh, is very little media. Yeah. Just limit media, violent imagery, shocking imagery presented in a shocking way. I'm talking about the news, not the entertainment. And uh, the idea that you go through uh, dinner with the local news on, are you kidding? And the kids yeah. are there and these are the images they're seeing, images that uh, Carrie Fisher said, uh, these are things that we spent thousands of years protecting children from and now we are giving it to them in their homes. Millions of homes all over America have it on during dinner during breakfast. This is what kids are seeing every day about the outside world with no uh, discussion that helps them assimilate what they're seeing. Nobody's saying, well, first of all, I don't, I, I don't favor helping them assimilate what they see. I favor them not seeing it in the first place, right? The local news, if it's bad for us, you can be sure it's really bad for children. We don't give kids enough credit to distinguish between fantasy and reality. Kids know that Grand Theft Auto, uh, Call of Duty, a lot of things, that's all fantasy. They know that. But when they see TV trucks in front of a school and you have kids looking like them and you see the blood trail and they play over the same, they loop that same 30 seconds of the kids being huddled out of the school over and over and over again, that to me could be traumatizing for kids. But the six o'clock gore reports, you know, whether you're in New York, L.A., Small town in Minnesota, small town in Mexico, Texas, wherever you go, it's the fodder for the six o'clock news and they love that stuff. And that's not going away. Yes. Uh, I used to have the habit when I'd walk in the house, the first thing I'd do is turn on the TV. Sure. You know, the company thing, it's almost like background noise. I started having kids and started hearing the noise, which is really what it is, through, through my children's eyes. Mm. And all of a sudden I'd hear kidnapped or bombing or robbery, you know, my local news. And I thought, oh my goodness. And then I finally, it, took, it, it actually is an addiction, it was for me, sure. to be able to shut it off. It was tough. And I started putting on music instead. And what I really noticed for myself was that I was a happier person when I wasn't getting bombarded. Mm. You know, I, I, I found out what I needed to know from other sources and I stopped watching the local news. Yes, we're, we're brought up to believe that if you're a good citizen, you watch the news, that's a, some kind of civic duty, and, uh, and that, that, you know, that's how you become informed. And of course, all the important things that happen that you actually need to know about, which are very, very few, uh, but all of them you will learn about. You will hear about them somewhere. It's, it's not possible today to simply not know that some enormous uh, international event has occurred or that some problem is underway. So I recommend never watching the local news, right? People are far happier if they don't watch it and far less happy when they do watch it. Life is a sexually transmitted, always fatal condition. <laughs> and that is the basic reality that people are fighting with the distractions of media and iPhones and iPads and internet and, and social connectivity and all, and products and food and drugs and smoking and all the things that we do to not look up at just the reality of this human condition. And then, if you accept that idea that, uh, that life in this form, in this body, ends and changes, then you can start deciding what do you wanna do with it. Yeah. And one of the things I'm hoping we can help people understand is that the issue is not how shall we die. The issue is how shall we live. And it doesn't have to be with all of that stuff about uh, horror and dread and loss and car accidents and kids being killed every day from all over the world, imported to us by satellite and brought into our own homes. So what I hope happens is that people see things for what they really are and then understand that there are storm clouds in life but uh, fly more freely in the space between those clouds, which is where we can live most of the time. 
because it's quite remarkable, if you look at how we live, our homes are hooked up to uh, lethal amounts of electricity, explosive gases. Uh, people 100 years ago would think we're crazy driving around in 2,000 pound missiles that can crush us easily, escalators that we could get wrapped up in, and yet we all go through our lives and the vast majority of the time we make it through safely and we make it through with other people who treat us well and whom we treat well, strangers and friends and family alike. That's what our lives are most of the time. You wouldn't know it, of course, to watch the news, and so the best way is to not watch the news.